Men uh, noemt het wel eens een voorspel, dames en heren. En uh, dat, uh, ja, dat, dat, dat ervaar ik ook wel zo. Het, het is pas morgen TEDx hier in Amsterdam, in de stad Schouwburg. Maar, mijn god, ik ben, ik ben nu al een beetje zenuwachtig. Zeker als ik, uh, als ik, als ik jou zie en die duizend kilo inspiratie die, uh, die valt over me heen. Heb je dat, Stolzen? Heb je dat altijd tijdens het voorspel, dat je zenuwachtig wordt? Soms wel, ja. Ja? Okay. ja dat, ik kan er wel last van hebben. Ja. Dat, ja, ja, dat uh, komt het resultaat meestal ten goede, trouwens. Ik maar zeggen, dit volledig ja. terzijde. Ja, uh, Jim Stolzen, jij bent de man die TEDx uh, ooit naar Nederland heeft gebracht. 2009, is ongelooflijk dat het alweer... Uh, uh, ja, dit wordt de derde editie. Ja. En ben je nou zelf een beetje geprikkeld en zenuwachtig? Ja, ja meer dan ooit. Ja? ja? Heb je ooit gehuild tijdens een TED-talk? Ja, meerdere keren. Uh, zelfs nog uh, dit jaar bij TEDx Maastricht in de zaal. Ja? Ongelooflijk veel. En bij TED zelf ook bij, uh, ja, regelmatig. Ja, dus het, het, het blijft je raken, die bron van inspiratie. Ja, alle, alle zintuigen. Nog hoor, ik, 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 ik ben zo'n nerd dat als ik in de auto een ver moet rijden, dan mm -hmm. zet ik niet de radio aan, dan luister ik naar TED Talks. Dan kan ik nog geëmotioneerd raken, ook al heb ik het verhaal voor de 65 keer gehoord. Lijkt me erg gevaarlijk in het verkeer. Ja, dat is wel eens gevaarlijk, ja. En enkele boodschappen van algemeen nut. Uh, als u nou zit te kijken thuis of op het werk of ja, misschien wel luisterend in de auto, hoe je dat dan ook doet, waarschijnlijk via een of andere telefoonverbinding. Uh, je, je, kan, je kan twitteren naar uh, hashtag TEDxAms. Um, Amst staat dan voor Amsterdam. Hey. Uh, en dan kan je een vraag stellen die ik zo dadelijk uh, doorpas uh, naar Jim. En dan komt jouw tweetvraag komt dan hier in deze bokaal. En dan trekken we straks een kaartje uit. En dan kan je of dit boek winnen, dames en heren, of een van de laatste entry bewijzen om er morgen live bij te zijn hier in de stad Schouwburg TEDx Amsterdam. Um, het format dicteert dat wij uh, een uitgekozen TED Talk gaan kijken. Eentje die jij hebt uitgekozen, eentje die jou ja. ontzettend geraakt heeft um, in, in 15 woorden. Welke talk en waarom? We gaan kijken naar de talk van Benjamin Zander. Dat is een dirigent uit Boston. En die laat in 18 minuten drie dingen zien. Dat je klassieke muziek anders kunt beluisteren dan dat je tot dan toe deed. Iets over leiderschap en nog een persoonlijke boodschap. Ja, nou, volgens mij kunnen we nou gaan kijken. of you know the story of the two salesmen who went down to Africa in the 1900s they were sent down to find if there was any opportunity for selling shoes and they wrote telegrams back to Manchester and one of them wrote situation hopeless stop they don't wear shoes and the other one wrote glorious opportunity they don't have any shoes yet Now, there's a similar situation in the classical music world, because there are some people who think that classical music is dying, and there are some of us who think you ain't seen nothing yet. And rather than go into statistics and trends and tell you about all the orchestras that are closing and the record companies that are folding, I thought we should do an experiment tonight. An experiment. Actually, it's not really an experiment, because I know the outcome. But it's like an experiment. Now, before we, <laughs> before we start, I need to do two things. One is I want to remind you of what a seven-year-old child sounds like when he plays the piano. Maybe you have this child at home. He sounds something like this. Some of you recognize this child. Now, if he practices for a year and takes lessons, he's now eight and he sounds like this. And then he practices for another year and takes lessons, now he's nine. And then he practices for another year and takes lessons, now he's ten. At that point, they usually give up. 
Now, if you'd waited, if you'd waited for one more year, you would have heard this. was not maybe what you thought, which was he suddenly became passionate, engaged, involved, got a new teacher, he hit, pu hit puberty, or whatever it is. What actually happened was the impulses were reduced. You see, the first time he was playing with an impulse on every note. And the second with an impulse every other note. You can see it by looking at my head. The th the nine-year-old nine put an impulse on every four notes. And the ten-year-old on every eight notes. And the eleven-year-old one impulse on the whole phrase. I, ne I don't know how I got into this position. <laughs> I didn't say I'm going to move my shoulder over, move my body. No, the music pushed me over, which is why I call it one buttock playing can be the other button. You know, a gentleman was once watching uh, a presentation I was doing, and I was working with a young pianist. He was the president of a corporation in Ohio. And I was working with this young pianist, and I said, the trouble with you is you're a two-buttock player. You should be a one-buttock player. And I moved his body like that while he was playing. And suddenly, the music took off took flight. There was a gasp in the audience when they heard the difference. And then I got a letter from this gentleman. He said, I was so moved, I went back and I transformed my entire company into a one buttock company. <laughs> <laughs> now, the other thing I want to do is to tell you about you. There are 1,600 people, I believe. My estimation is that probably 45 of you are absolutely passionate about classical music. You adore classical music. Your FM is always on that classical dial, and you have CDs in your car, and you go to the symphony, and your children are playing instruments. You can't imagine your life without classical music. That's the first group. It's quite a small group. Then there's another group, bigger group. These are the people who don't mind classical music. <laughs> You know, you come home from a long day and you take a glass of wine and you put your feet up, a little Vivaldi in the background doesn't do any harm, right? That's the second group. Now comes the third group. These are the people who never listen to classical music. It's just simply not part of your life. You might hear it like secondhand smoke at the airport, but, and, and maybe a little bit of a march from Aida when you come into the hall, but otherwise you never hear it. That's probably the largest group of all. And then there's a very small group. These are the people who, who think they're tone deaf. Amazing number of people think they're tone deaf. Actually, I hear a lot, my husband is tone deaf. <laughs> Actually, you cannot be tone deaf. Nobody is tone deaf. If you were tone deaf, you couldn't change the gears on your car, in a stick shift car. You couldn't tell the difference between somebody from Texas and somebody from Rome. And the telephone, the telephone. If, some, if your mother calls on their miserable telephone, she calls and says, hello, you not only know who it is, you know what mood she's in. Uh, you have a fantastic ear. Everybody has a fantastic ear. So nobody is tone deaf. But I tell you what, it doesn't work for me to go on with this thing with such a wide gulf between those who understand, love, and passionate about classical music and those who have no relationship to it at all. The tone deaf people, they're no longer here. But even between those three categories, it's too wide a gulf. So I'm not going to go on until every single person in this room, downstairs and in Aspen, and everybody else looking, will come to love and understand classical music. So that's what we're going to do. Now, you notice that there is not the slightest doubt in my mind that this is going to work, if you look at my face, right? <laughs> it's one of the characteristics of a leader that he not doubt for one moment the capacity of the people he's leading to realize whatever he's dreaming. Imagine if Martin Luther King had said, I have a dream! Of course, I'm not sure they'll be up to it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to take a piece of Chopin. This is a beautiful prelude by Chopin. Some of you will know it.
I think probably happened in this room. When I started, you thought, how beautiful that sounds. I don't think we should go to the same place for our summer holidays next year. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? It's funny. How those thoughts kind of waft into your head when we're listening to gospel music. And of, course, <laughs> and of course, if peace is long and you've had a long day, you might actually drift off. And then your companion will dig you in the ribs and say, wake up, it's culture. And then you feel even worse. <laughs> but has it ever occurred to you that the reason you feel sleepy in classical music is not because of you, but because of us? Did anybody think while I was playing, why is he using so many impulses? If I'd done this with my head, you certainly would have thought it. <laughs> and for the rest of your life, every time you hear classical music, you'll always be able to know if you hear those impulses. So let's see what's really going on here. We have a B. This is a B. The next note is a C. And the job of the C is to make the B sad. And it does, doesn't it? <laughs> Composers know that. If they want sad music, they just play those two notes. But basically, it's just a B with four sads. Now it goes down to A, and now to G, and then to F. So we have B, A, G, F. And if we have B, A, G, F, what do we expect next? Oh, that might have been a fluke. Let's try it again. Ooh, the Ted Choir. And you notice, <laughs> you notice nobody is tone deaf. Is that right? Nobody's, you know, every village in Bangladesh and every uh, 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 hamlet in, in, in China, everybody knows. Da, 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 da. Everybody knows who's expecting that E. Now, Chopin didn't want to reach the E there because what will have happened? It'll be over, like Hamlet. Do you remember Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 3? He finds out that his uncle killed his father. You remember, he keeps on going up to his uncle and almost killing him. And then he backs away and then he goes up to him again and almost kills him. And the critics, all of whom are sitting in the back row there, they have to have an opinion. So they say, Hamlet is a procrastinator. <laughs> <laughs> or they say, Hamlet has an Oedipus complex. No, otherwise the play would be over, stupid. <laughs> That's why Shakespeare puts all that stuff in Hamlet, you know, Ophelia going mad and the play within the play and Yorick's skull and the grave diggers. That's in order to delay until Act 5 he can kill him. It's the same with the Chopin. He's just about to reach the E and he says, oops, better go back up and do it again. So he does it again. Now he gets excited. That's excitement, you don't have to worry about it. Now he gets to F sharp and finally he goes down to E. But it's the wrong chord. Because the chord he's looking for is this one. Right. And he said he does. Now we call that a deceptive cadence because it deceives us. I always tell my students, if you have a deceptive cadence, be sure to raise your eyebrows, then everybody will know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So he gets to E, but it's the wrong chord. Now he tries E again. That chord doesn't work. Now he tries E again. That chord doesn't work. Now he tries, tries E again. That doesn't work. And then finally, there was a gentleman in the front row who went, mm. Like that. It's the same gesture he makes when he comes home after a long day, turns off the key in his car and says, ah, oh, I'm home, because we all know where home is. So this is a piece which goes from away to home, and I'm going to play it all the way through, and you're going to follow. B, C, B, C, B, C, B, D, down to A, down to G, down to F, almost goes to E, but otherwise the play would be over. Goes back up to B, gets very excited, goes to F sharp, goes to E, it's the wrong chord, it's the wrong chord, it's the wrong chord, and finally goes to E, and it's home. And what you're going to see is one buttock playing. <laughs> because for me to join the B to the E, I have to stop thinking about every single note along the way and start thinking about the long, long line from B to E. I, you know, we, we were just in South Africa and uh, you can't go to South Africa without thinking of Mandela in jail for 27 years. What was he thinking about, lunch? No, he was thinking about the vision for South Africa and for human beings.
That's what cares. This is about vision. This is about the long line, like the bird who flies over the field and doesn't care about the fences underneath, all right? So now you're going to follow the line all the way from B to E. And I have one last request before I play this piece all the way through. Would you think of somebody who you adore who's no longer there? A beloved grandmother, a lover, somebody in your life who you love with all your heart, but that person is no longer with you. Bring that person into your mind, and at the same time, follow the line all the way from B to E, and you'll hear everything that Chopin had to say. Now, you may, you may be wondering, you, you, you may be wondering, you may be wondering why I'm clapping. Well, I did this at a school in Boston with about 70, uh, seventh graders, 12 year olds. And I did exactly what I did with you, and I told them and explained them the whole thing. And at the end, they went crazy, clapping. They were clapping. I was clapping. They were clapping. Finally, I said, Why am I clapping? And one of these little kids said, Because we were listening. <laughs> Think of it, 1,600 people, busy people, involved in all sorts of different things, listening, understanding, and being moved by a piece by Chopin. Now that is something. Now am I sure that every single person followed that, understood it was moved by it? Of course I can't be sure, but I tell you what happened to me. I was in Ireland during the Troubles 10 years ago, and I was working with some Catholic and Protestant kids uh, on conflict resolution, and I did this with them risky thing to do because they were street kids and one of them came to me the next morning and he said you know I've never listened to classical music in my life but when you played that shopping piece <laughs> he said my brother was shot last year and I didn't cry for him but last night when you played that piece he was the one I was thinking about and I felt the tears streaming down my face and you know it felt really good to cry for my brother so I made up my mind at that moment that classical music is for everybody. Everybody. Now, how would you walk? Because you know my profession, the music profession, doesn't see it that way. They say 3% of the population likes classical music. If only we could move it to 4%, our problems would be over. <laughs> I say, how would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you thought 3% of the population likes classical music? If only we could move it to 4%. How would you walk? How would you talk? How would you be if you thought everybody loves classical music? They just haven't found out about it yet. <laughs> See, these are totally different worlds. Now, 
I had an amazing experience. I was 45 years old. I'd been conducting for 20 years, and I suddenly had a realization. The conductor of an orchestra doesn't make a sound. My picture appears on the front of the CD. <laughs> But the conductor doesn't make a sound. He depends for his power on his ability to make other people powerful. And that changed everything for me. It was totally life-changing. People in my orchestra came up to me and said, Ben, what happened? That's what happened. I realized my job was to awaken possibility in other people. And of course, I wanted to know whether I was doing that. And you know how you find out? You look at their eyes. If their eyes are shining, you know you're doing it. You could light up a village with this guy's eyes. <laughs> Right, so if, you, if the eyes are shining, you know you're doing it. If the eyes are not shining, you get to ask a question, and this is the question. Who am I being that my player's eyes are not shining? We can do that with our children, too. Who am I being that my children's eyes are not shining? That's a totally different world. Now, we're all about to end this magical on the mountain week, and we're going back into the world. And I say, it's appropriate for us to ask the question, who are we being as we go back out into the world? And you know, I have a definition of success. For me, it's very simple. It's not about wealth and fame and power. It's about how many shining eyes I have around me. So now, I have one last thought, which is that it really makes a difference what we say, the words that come out of our mouth. I learned this from a woman who survived Auschwitz, one of the rare survivors. She went to Auschwitz when she was 15 years old, and um, her brother was eight, and the parents were lost. And um, she told me this. She said, we were in the train going to Auschwitz, and I looked down and I saw my brother's shoes were missing. And I said, why are you so stupid? Can't you keep your things together, for goodness sake? The way an elder sister might speak to a younger brother. Unfortunately, it was the last thing she ever said to him because she never saw him again. He did not survive. And so when she came out of Auschwitz, she made a vow. She told me this. She said, I walked out of Auschwitz into life, and I made a vow, and the vow was, I will never say anything that couldn't stand as the last thing I ever say. Now, can we do that? No, and we'll make ourselves wrong and others wrong. But it is a possibility to live into. Thank you. Shining eyes. <laughs> Shining eyes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We zitten nog steeds midden in de Day Before TEDx samen met uh, Jim Stolze, publicist, schrijver, organisator en inspirator. Dat, dat, als ik jouw cv zou maken, dan zou ik dat zo doen. Jij was er live bij, hè, bij deze meneer. Jij zat in de zaal. Ja, ik ben weer, uh, ik ben weer een beetje stil daarvan, ja. ja. Oh. Dat was ook, was ook gek, want we keken even mee en Jim kan voorspellen wat hij allemaal gaat zeggen. Hoe vaak heb je deze talk gezien? <laughs> ja, dat is beschamend. Ik denk meer dan 15 keer. Meer dan 15 ja. keer. Fantastisch. Ja. En, en je hebt hem ook gekozen als de leukste TED-talk die je ooit gezien hebt. Kan je dan... De ingrediënten die de leukste TED-talk voor Jim Stoltz moet hebben, welke zijn dat dan? Nee, als mensen TED niet kennen, dan zijn er een paar talks die ik suggereer. Ik denk Ken ja. Robinson is degene die, die iedereen wel kent. En Gaat waardoor... over education? Ja, als je die hebt gezien, dan valt dat kwartje, snap je, in één keer waar, uh, waar TED over gaat. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Zender weet ik niet of, je die, of hij je in één keer kan pakken. Maar ik weet wel dat dit, wat hij doet, ik bedoel, hij heeft geen, geen slides. Uh, hij heeft het ook niet van tevoren ingestudeerd. Het is niet een groot idee, maar die man is zijn verhaal. En dat ben ik heel erg gaan bewonderen aan de beste TED-sprekers. Hoe hij ook voor die groep staat, hoe hij erin loopt. Ja. Er is niks bedachts aan. Het is geen format. Hij is gewoon zijn verhaal. Hij moet dat kwijt. En daarom gelooft iedereen. En we staan ze heel hard te klappen voor. Ja. 
prachtig. Ja. Ik, 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 ik adviseer mensen die misschien op kantoor zaten en, en met een half oog heb ik meegekeken. Ja. Zo rond een uur of elf s'avonds met een klein glaasje een wijn, wijn. Ja. werkt hij het best. Ja. Toch? Ja. Dat, tot die conclusie waren wij gekomen. Hey, we gaan het hebben over, over, over TEDx morgen. Hè? Want, want dit is het voorspel, daar hadden we het daarnet al, daarnet ja. al over. Morgen gaat het er echt gebeuren. Volgepakte Stadschouwburg, TEDx Amsterdam. Um, Wat is het thema van dit jaar? Het thema is Human Nature. Ja, want een thema is belangrijk. Hè? Ik, ik, soms, TEDx en wereldwijd hebben geen thema. Jij houdt vast aan een vrij... Duidelijk helder thema waar rond zich dan sprekers kunnen plooien. Nou, het, ja, het is eigenlijk het allermoeilijkste onderdeel van, mm -hmm. het, uh, van, van het congres. Hoe, hoe komt het tot stand, de keuze van zo'n thema? Nou, deze is tot stand gekomen tijdens een bijeenkomst van onze Brain Trust. Dat is een groepje van ja. ex-sprekers, uh, onze adviesraad. Uh, volgens mij was jij er zelfs ook bij. Klopt. Uh, kwamen we samen om te praten over wat houd je nou bezig? Wat zijn de thema's waar zou het dit jaar over moeten gaan? Mm -hmm. En door zo'n middag met elkaar te praten met allerlei interessante mensen, onder voorzitterschap van Louise Fresco overigens, kwamen we erachter dat er heel veel rode draden waren. En een daarvan was bijvoorbeeld de menselijke maat, dat die vaak kwijt is. Ik bedoel, de maatschappij wordt steeds meer uh, gedomineerd door mm -hmm. technologie. Ja. We communiceren meer, maar niet noodzakelijk beter. Nou, dat was een duidelijk uh, topic. De helft van onze beslissingen wordt genomen door de algoritmes. Ja, wat betekent dan nog om mensen te zijn? Precies, het gaat over, eigenlijk over de, de spanning die er ontstaat tussen de mechanisering in de maatschappij, de algoritmisering, de googlisering ja. en daarnaast eigenlijk datgene wat, wat, blijft wat er nog de, de mens doet aan emotie, liefde, enthousiasme en hoe die twee dingen samen kunnen gaan. En, Klopt. En de sprekers morgen zullen allemaal aan die kapstok gehangen worden. Ja, nou dit is één haakje van, van, van de kapstok. Wat we ook met Human Nature proberen is meer human-to-human -human communication, mm -hmm. veel meer verhalen van... Hart tot hart bijvoorbeeld. Ja. Vorig jaar hebben we fantastische sprekers gehad, maar door het thema science and fiction was het vaak instrumenteel. Ging het over ja. nanotechnologie, zwarte gaten, elektrisch rijden. Dat heb je met dat thema. Precies. Ja. Terwijl wat Benjamin Zender doet hier, of uh, wat we in Tennis Maastricht hebben meegemaakt, ja. dat was echt van mens tot mens. Ja. We, we zitten met Jim Stoltzen, de, ja, de, 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 de energie achter TEDx Amsterdam. Bestempel als energie, klinkt wel goed. We hebben een Twittervraag, <laughs> dames en heren. Waar is de vraag? Die wordt mij nu aangereikt. U kan ook nog steeds, als u, als, u, als u thuis op kantoor ergens in het zwembad ligt, uh, u kan steeds twitteren met een vraag. Te winnen een boek, dan wel een last entry ticket voor Tetix morgen. Alexander 1058. Oh nee, sorry. Oh, mevrouw Alexandra uh, 1058. Welke TED Talks hebben Jim zo geïnspireerd dat hij hier zelf, als hij stopt met Tetix Amsterdam, mee door zou willen gaan? Dat vind ik een vrij filosofische vraag die ja. onderschrijft dat human nature toch belangrijk is. Als je ooit stopt met TEDx Amsterdam, ja. waarom zou je dan toch met het gedachtegoed doorgaan? En welke TED Talk heeft je dan zo geïnspireerd? Dat is de vraag. Welke ja, kijk, de, de, überhaupt, de, de, wat ik ervaarde toen ik bij TED in de zaal was, was de, de positieve energie. Het, het, het optimisme en niet een naïef optimisme. Maar heel duidelijk benoemen waar de problemen zijn en vervolgens met oplossingen komen. Mm -hmm. En dat is wat ik, wat ik, wat ik in Nederland uh, vaak miste. Daar zijn we heel goed in het analyseren van de problemen. Kijken waar het fout gaat, een beetje zwarte pieten. En dan vervolgens dan zeggen we ja, zo is het en dan gaan we naar huis. En bij dit was het juist dat er altijd iemand was die ergens naartoe wees. Mm -hmm. dat, dat je dacht, ja, volgens mij als we daar met, met elkaar de schouders onder zetten, dan zou dat wel eens kunnen gebeuren. Mm -hmm. Dus in die zin, dat stuk voor stuk, alle, alle, alle sprekers die hebben wel gemeen dat ze iets bij mij hebben veranderd in mijn hersenen, dat ik anders naar dingen ben gaan kijken. Dus als ik, uh, als ik niet met TEDx bezig zou zijn, dan zou ik dat nog steeds meenemen. Mm -hmm. en... is, is het een eindig ecosysteem trouwens, TEDx? Want het is, het is iets wat multipliceert, hè? Het is iets ja. wat groot. Ja, Alleen zeker. in Nederland heb je nee, een aantal... Het is uit de hand gelopen. Ja. TED dacht oorspronkelijk dat er 24 van zouden ja. komen. Dat wat mensen die enthousiast waren over TED, dat die het in hun eigen land zouden doen. Nou, vorig jaar jullie stond de teller op 2000. Juist. Dus is het eindig? Nee, ik denk niet dat het, uh, dat, 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 dat het eindig is. Ik denk dat dit voor een hoop mensen in de evenementenindustrie even, even slik is. Want het legt ook eigenlijk een bom onder hun uh, model. Want TEDx events, die, dat zijn niet echt business cases. Nee. Er, er, er wordt geen geld verdiend. Exact. Dus je kan voor je inspiratie kan je naar een TEDx. Wat is dan nog... Waarom ga je dan eigenlijk nog naar andere congressen? Dus ik denk in die zin dat veel congressen wat zullen overnemen van TEDx. Mm -hmm. Maar dat TEDx heel lang uh, nog zal bestaan. TEDx, ins inspiratie is zeer waardevol. Doch wordt u graag en gratis aangeboden. 
Zoiets. Ja, gratis, dat gaat er bij mij niet in, maar ik snap nee, wat je bedoelt. Ik snap wat ik bedoel. Ja. Uh, we hebben een strak schema. We, we, we moeten en we gaan, ja. en dat doen we ook met plezier, naar iemand die zo dadelijk aanschuift op een uh, misschien iets wat voor ons uh, hier in Nederland bizar wijze. Want uh, de mevrouw die zo dadelijk aanschuift op het kleine podium hier in de stad Schouwburg, komt niet met haar gezicht in beeld, dan wel met haar handen. Dat komt omdat zij uh, activist is, zij, zij blogt, zij uh, organiseert uh, een, een, een free meaning of speech en dat, uh, dat doet ze in Bahrein. Uh, we gaan even kijken naar de TED-talk die haar geïnspireerd heeft en dan praten we zo dadelijk met Ezra El Shafai verder. Imagine if you could record your life, everything you said, everything you did, available in a perfect memory store at your fingertips. So you could go back and find memorable moments and relive them, or sift through traces of time and discover patterns in your own life that previously had gone undiscovered. Well, that's exactly the journey that my family began five and a half years ago. This is my wife and collaborator, Rupal. And on this day, at this moment, we walked into the house with our first child, our beautiful baby boy. And we walked into a house with a very special home video recording system. Ready? Mm -hmm. One second. Okay. This moment and thousands of other moments special for us were captured in our home because in every room in the house, if you looked up, you'd see a camera and a microphone. And if you looked down, you'd get this bird's eye view of the room. Here's our living room, the baby bedroom, kitchen, dining room, and the rest of the house. And all of these fed into a disc array that was designed for continuous capture. So here we are flying through a day in our home as we move from sunlit morning through incandescent evening and finally lights out for the day. Over the course of three years, we recorded eight to 10 hours a day, amassing roughly a quarter million hours of multi-track audio and video. So you're looking at a piece of what is by far the largest home video collection ever made. <laughs> I think that's clear. And what this data represents for our family at a personal level, the, the, the impact has already been immense and we're still learning its value. Countless moments of unsolicited, natural moments, not posed moments, are captured there and we're starting to learn how to discover them and find them. But there's also a scientific reason that drove this project, which was to use this kind of natural longitudinal data to understand the process of how a child learns language, that child being my son. And so with many privacy provisions put in place to protect everyone who's recorded in the data, we made elements of the data available to my trusted research team at MIT so we could start teasing apart patterns in this massive data set, trying to understand the influence of social environments on language acquisition. So we're looking here at one of the first things we started to do. This is my wife and I cooking breakfast in the kitchen. And as we move through space and through time, a very everyday pattern of life in the kitchen, in order to convert this opaque 90,000 hours of video into something we can start to see, we use motion analysis to pull out, as we move through space and through time, what we call space-time worms. And this has become a part of our toolkit for being able to look and see where the activities are in the data, and with it, trace the patterns of, in particular, where my son moved throughout the home, so that we could focus our transcription efforts, all the speech environment, around my son, all the words that he heard from myself, my wife, our nanny, and over time, the words he began to produce. So with that, 
technology and that data and the ability to, with machine assistance, transcribe speech, we've now transcribed well over 7 million words of our home transcripts. And with that, let me take you now for a first tour into the data. So you've all, I'm sure, seen time-lapse videos where a flower will blossom as you accelerate time. I'd like you to now experience the blossoming of a speech form. My son, soon after his first birthday, would say gaga to mean water. And over the course of the next half year, he slowly learned to approximate the proper adult form, water. So we're going to cruise through half a year in about 40 seconds. No video here, so you can focus on the sound, the acoustics, of a new kind of trajectory. Gaga to water. He sure nailed it, didn't he? So he didn't just learn water. Over the course of the 24 months, the first two years that we really focused on, this is a map of every word he learned in chronological order. And because we have full transcripts, we've identified each of the 503 words that he learned to produce by his second birthday. He was an early talker. And so we started to analyze why. Why were certain words born before others? This is one of the first results that came out of our study uh, a little over a year ago that really surprised us. The way to interpret this apparently simple graph is on the vertical is an indication of how complex caregiver utterances are based on the length of utterances. And the vertical axis is time. And all of the data we aligned based on the, the following idea. Every time my son would learn a word, we would trace back and look at all of the language he heard that contained that word, and we would plot the relative length of the utterances. And what we found was this curious phenomena that caregiver speech would systematically dip to a minimum, making language as simple as possible, and then slowly ascend back up in complexity. And the amazing thing was that the, that bounce, that dip, lined up almost precisely with when each word was born, word after word, systematically. So it appears that all three primary caregivers, myself, my wife, and our nanny, were systematically, and I would think subconsciously, restructuring our language to meet him at the moment of the birth of a word and bring him gently into more complex language. And the implications of this, there are many, but one I just want to point out is that there must be amazing feedback loops. It's not, of course, my son is learning from his linguistic environment, but the environment is learning from him. That environment, people, are in these tight feedback loops and creating a kind of scaffolding that has not been noticed until now. But that's looking at the speech context. What about the visual context? We're now looking at, think of this as a dollhouse cutaway of, the, of our house. We've taken those circular fisheye lens cameras and we've done some optical correction, and then we can bring it into a three-dimensional life. So welcome to my home. <laughs> this is a moment, one moment captured across multiple cameras. The reason we did this is to create the ultimate memory machine, where you can go back and interactively fly around and then breathe video life into this system. What I'm going to do is give you an accelerated view of 30 minutes, again, of just life in the living room. That's me and my son on the floor. And there's video analytics that are tracking our movements. My son is leaving red ink. I'm leaving green ink. We're now on the couch looking out through the window at cars passing by. And finally, my son playing in a walking toy by himself. Now we freeze the action, 30 minutes. We turn time into the vertical axis. And we open up for a view of these interaction traces we've just left behind. 
and we see these amazing structures. These little knots of two colors of, of thread we call social hotspots. The spiral thread we call a solo hotspot, and we think that these affect the way language is learned. What we'd like to do is start understanding the interaction between these patterns and the language that my son is exposed to to see if we can predict how the structure of when words are heard affects when they're learned. So in other words, the relationship between words and what they're about in the world. So here's how we're approaching this. In this video, again, my son is being traced out. He's leaving red ink behind, and there's our nanny by the door. You want water? All right. She offers water, and off go the two worms over to the kitchen to get water. And what we've done is use the word water to tag that moment, that bit of activity. And now we take the power of data and take every time my son ever heard the word water and the context he saw it in, and we use it to penetrate through the video and find every activity trace that co-occurred with the instance of water. And what this data leaves in its wake is a landscape. We call these wordscapes. This is the wordscape for the word water. And you can see most of the action is in the kitchen. That's where those big peaks are over to the left. And just for contrast, we can do this with any word. We can take the word by, as in goodbye, and we're now zoomed in over the entrance to the house, and we look and we find, as you'd expect, a contrast in the landscape where the word by occurs much more in a structured way. So we're using these structures to start predicting the order of language acquisition, and, and that's uh, sort of ongoing work now. In my lab, which we're peering into now at MIT, this is at the Media Lab, this has become my favorite way of videographing just about any space. Three of the key people in this project, Philip DeCamp, Ronnie Kubat, and Brandon Roy are pictured here. Uh, Philip has been a close collaborator on all the visualizations you're seeing. And Michael Fleischman was another PhD student in my lab who worked with me on this home video analysis. And he made the following observation, that just the way that we're analyzing how language connects to events which provide common ground for language, that same idea we can take out of your home, Deb, and we can apply it to the world of public media. And so our effort took an unexpected turn. Think of mass media as providing common ground. And you have the recipe for taking this idea to a whole new place. We've started analyzing television content using the same principles, analyzing event structure of a TV signal, episodes of shows, commercials, all of the components that make up the event structure. And we're now, with satellite dishes, pulling in and analyzing a good part of all the TV being watched in the United States. And you don't have to now go and instrument living rooms with microphones to get people's conversations. You just tune into publicly available social media feeds. So we're pulling in about 3 billion comments a month. And then the magic happens. You have the event structure, the common ground that the words are about coming out of the television feeds. You've got the conversations that are about that, those topics. And through semantic analysis, and this is actually real data you're looking at from our data our, our processing, each yellow line is showing a link being made between a comment in the wild and a piece of event structure coming out of the television signal. And the same idea now can be built up, and we get this wordscape, except now words are not assembled in my living room. Instead, the context, the common ground, the activities, are the content on television that's driving the conversations. And so what we're seeing here, these skyscrapers now, are commentary that are linked to content on television. Same concept, but looking at communication dynamics in a different, very different sphere. So fundamentally, rather than, for example, measuring content based on how many people are watching, this gives us the basic data for looking at engagement properties of content. And just like we can look at feedback cycles and dynamics in, in, a, in a family, we can now open up the same concepts and look at uh, much larger groups of people. This is a subset of data from our database, just 50,000 out of several million, and the social graph that connects them through publicly available sources. 
And if you put them on one plane, a second plane is where the content lives. So we have the programs and the, the sporting events and the commercials and all of the link structures that tie them together make a content graph. And then the important third dimension. Each of the links that you're seeing rendered here is an actual connection made between something someone said and a piece of content. And there are, again, now tens of millions of these links that give us the connective tissue of social graphs and how they relate to content. And we can now start to probe the structure in interesting ways. So if we, for example, trace the path of one piece of content that drives someone to comment on it, and then we follow where that comment goes and look at the entire social graph that becomes activated, and then trace back to see the relationship between that social graph and content, very interesting structure becomes visible. We call this a, a co-viewing clique, a virtual living room, if you will. And there are fascinating dynamics at play. It's not one way. A piece of content, an event, causes someone to talk. They talk to other people. That drives tune-in behavior back into mass media. And you have these cycles that drive the overall behavior. Another example, very different, another actual person in our database, and we're finding at least hundreds, if not thousands of these. We've given this person a name. This is a pro-amateur or pro-am media critic who has this high fan out race. A lot of people are following this person, very influential, and they have a propensity to talk about what's on TV. So this person is a key link in connecting mass media and social media together. One last example from this data. Sometimes it's actually the piece of content that is special. So if we go and look at this piece of content, President Obama's State of the Union address from just a few weeks ago, and look at what we find in, in the same data set at the same scale, the engagement properties of this piece of content are truly remarkable. A nation exploding in conversation in real time in response to what's on, on the, the broadcast. And of course, through all of these lines are flowing unstructured language. We can x-ray and get a real-time pulse of a nation, real-time sense of the social reactions and the different circuits in the social graph being activated by content. So to summarize, the idea is this. As our world becomes increasingly instrumented and we have the capabilities to collect and connect the dots between what people are saying and the context they're saying it in, What's emerging is an ability to see new social structures and dynamics that have previously not been seen. It's like building a microscope or a telescope and revealing new structures about our own behavior around communication. And I think the implications here are profound, whether it's for science, for commerce, for government, but perhaps most of all, for us as individuals. And so just to return to my son, when I was preparing this talk, he was looking over my shoulder, and I showed him the clips I was going to show to you today, and I asked him for permission, granted. <laughs> and, and then I went on to reflect, isn't it amazing? This entire database, all these recordings, I'm going to hand up to you and to your sister, who arrived two years later. And you guys are going to be able to go back and, and re-experience moments that you could never, with your biological memory, possibly remember the way you can now. And he was quiet for a moment, and I thought, what am I thinking? He's, he's five years old. He does, he's not going to understand this. And just as I was having that thought, he looked up at me and said, so that when I grow up, I can show this to my kids? And I thought, wow, this is, this is powerful stuff. So I want to leave you with one last memorable moment from our family. This is our, the first time our son took more than two steps at once captured on film. And I really want you to focus on something as I, as I take you through. It's a cluttered environment. It's, it's natural life. My mother's in the kitchen cooking, and of all places in the hallway, I realize he's about to do it, about to take more than two steps. And so you hear me encouraging him, realizing what's happening, and then the magic happens. Listen very carefully. About three steps in, he realizes something magic is happening. And the most amazing feedback loop of all kicks in, and he takes a breath in, and he whispers, wow. And instinctively, I echo, I echo back the same. And so let's fly back in time to
to that memorable moment. Can you do it? Oh boy. Can you do it? <sighs> now he's walking. <laughs> Thank you. Nog steeds live vanuit Amsterdam, de day before TEDx, want morgen is tenslotte de grote dag. Uh, we bekijken TED Talks en vanuit die TED Talks hebben we gesprekken. Aangeschoven was reeds Jim Stolzen en aangeschoven nu, en dan spreek ik even, is Ezra al Shafai. Um, zij is niet in beeld, haar handen wel. En ja, dat is niet voor niets, maar daar komt u along the way van het gesprek wel achter. Ezra, welkom hier in Amsterdam. You arrived yesterday, today? Uh... Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning. Yeah. And a little bit enjoying the city, we hope. If, from what I see. From what you see. From the fog. <laughs> <laughs> from what you see through the fog. Yeah. Cool. Uh, tomorrow you will be on the main stage of uh, TEDx. We're very happy to have you here. Um, you're the founder and publisher of, of crowdvoice.org mm -hmm. and also of Midist Youth. Mm -hmm. um, these are places on the web who could be related with uh, activism um, in, in your region, and that's also the reason why we don't put your face uh, mm -hmm. right into the camera. Uh, also tomorrow at the main stage we will do something different uh, about that, so you're not too easy recognized. Um, that, that, that's quite odd. We will talk about that, that, that activist is layer around you. Nevertheless, you, you've chosen a TED talk that has nothing to do with activism. Yeah. Um, I was very inspired by this TED Talk, um, Deb Roy, because he, I think, is giving us a glimpse into the future of mm -hmm. technology, mm -hmm. but mostly not just technology for the sake of technology, but the kind of technology that can benefit communication, mm -hmm. um, can help us um, figure out human behavior, things like that. And I'm always inspired by things, technology and technological breakthroughs and groundbreaking um, especially internet related startups because mm -hmm. um, I always like to take examples that have nothing to do with politics or activism and make them into something that has to do with politics or activism. And, and activism because that's, that's exactly, uh, exactly what you do. So uh, let me be a little bit cynical about it. We, we, we all here in Holland and in this region followed what we have called uh, and baptized the Arab Spring. Mm. Um, and, and, and Globally, there is this trend that Twitter and Facebook is uh, an underlying foundation, an underlying power, an underlying vehicle of the change over there. Do you really think, and could you feed that a little bit with examples, that technology can be uh, a, a big element in, 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 the, disrupt, in the disruption of, of, of the political and religious constitution in your region? So I think the role of uh, the internet or technology in general is um, very, um, it's not one-sided. You can use it for good things and you can do it for bad things. Mm -hmm. The government uses, governments typically use it for bad things by tracking bloggers, imprisoning bloggers, um, by using the internet to um, develop propaganda techniques, to have websites that are preaching hatred and racism. Mm -hmm. um, so we are living in a very competitive um, w uh, media sphere, you know, mm -hmm. you're online as a website, but you also you have to be very savvy, very hip, very youthful, so that you can break through the noise and people listen to you and not to the extremist voices that are not advocating for everything that you're not standing for. So it's a, it's a new way to raise your voice. It's basically a new way to raise your voice and it's very helpful, but it yeah. doesn't mean that, tech, that Twitter and Facebook is the reason why things are happening like this in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely helps because, for example, with the media crackdown, um, Journalists were not allowed into the many countries of the Arab world, for example. 
Um, so we were using YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, these kinds of things yeah. to give awareness um, to um, media outlets. So most of the CNN videos and the Al Jazeera videos or BBC videos that you see are f taken directly from YouTube. It's not their own mm -hmm. um, videos or cameramen who are going onto the streets. W one, one little question, because we have to move on. I'm very sorry, but yeah. are, are you never afraid? Of course I'm afraid. I mean, that's why I'm not showing my face or everything. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be very cautious with what I do because I prefer uh, to do it outside of prison. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, you always have to be really careful with, I have mm -hmm. to self-censor myself to you be. Have friends in prison also? Yeah, of course. Uh, we ha I have many friends in, in prison, whether it's Egypt or Bahrain. Um, and it's something that I learned from. You can be in the front line without being too um, uh, vocal at the same time. Right. You can do things on the underground basis, mm -hmm. such as building platforms and technology for other people to use and multiply voices of dissent. Well, we, I, think I can talk about we, we are sure. looking forward a lot to your talk tomorrow on main stage. Thanks. Quite courageous what you're doing, very, very, very nice. We, we, we have a Twitter question. A last one, and then we have to we have to wrap up because the, the next session they're they're already pushing us from stage. I, I will I will do it in English. I will continue in English because the Twitter question is in English, so that's quite practical. Um, I think a man called Jonathan Marks asked a question for Jim. Uh, Jim, how will Jim? How will you ensure that the tertetics keeps fresh and different? How do you avoid the danger of routine? Ah, right. Yeah. Once is a coincidence, twice is a pattern, and three is a theme. So we're not trying to get bored. We're, we're trying to reinvent ourselves each time that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, most radical choice this year was to go smaller, but bigger. So we're doing less, less yeah. stuff. We're having less people at the venue. But at the same time, the things that we are doing, for example, the opening act with the National Ballet, that's going to be grand. And there are more Samacast locations than ever, more than 50 right now. So. We try to reinvent ourselves each time, each year. Ik hoop dat dat een uh, bevredigend antwoord is voor ons. And Jonathan is working actually uh, also on that. I know him very well. <laughs> Ik hoop dat dat een uh, bevredigend antwoord was, Mr. Jonathan. Um, blijf vooral kijken. Dit, hierna komt Mike de Jong. Hij presenteert uh, twee gasten, Anita Mooiweer en uh, Ellen de Jong, beide van uh, Sanema. En ook nog Viviane Bendemaker, ook van Sadema. Dat uh, zit allemaal in de editorial kant van dat fijne uitgeefbedrijf. Zo dadelijk het volgende uur. Blijf dus kijken, blijf twitteren. Uh, kijk morgen naar de livestream. Ga hier op de stoep liggen. Misschien breekt iemand zijn benen en kan hier in en lukt het jou net wel. Want het wordt een mooie dag. Dankjewel.